Good to see everyone tonight at our Wednesday night Bible study. And uh, if you're visiting with us, we're happy to have you here. Please hang around a little bit and uh, give us a chance to get to know you. Say hello to you tonight before you take off. We uh, have very uh, not much to mention from up here, so I want to encourage you please to um, look at our bulletin that's put out. Uh, a lot of great information in the bulletin uh, as far as uh, also listing those of our folks who need our prayers um, throughout the week and that we can pray for them. Uh, just encourage you not only to pray for them, but uh, just give them a call. Let them know that you're thinking about them and that you miss them. Some uh, folks to make note of, uh, Sharon Wakefield had surgery yesterday. She is here tonight. Good to see her. And also uh, Juan uh, Luis Jorge had his hip surgery last week. This week. No, we didn't. Tomorrow. So this is, um, okay. That's right. It is. I think it is. So Juan's going to have his hip surgery tomorrow. So definitely pray for him. Pray for Ellen. I heard that doctors don't necessarily make great patients. Okay. So we'll, <laughs> we'll pray for Ellen as well. Um, please continue to pray for all of our folks that are at Orlando for Lads of Leaders for the convention uh, this, this continue this week, that they have a good convention and plus that they have a good safe trip uh, back. Also, we want to rejoice with our new sister in Christ, Annabelle Underwood, who was baptized Wednesday. Is Annabelle here tonight? Can she stand up real quick? <laughs> There's our new sister in Christ, Annabelle. Thank you so much. Congratulations. That's exciting news. That's all the announcements I have. As always, just like to remind everyone to put your cell phones on silent. Uh, and if, if you're not using them as a Bible, I say turn them off. But that's just me. But anyway, um, let's all prepare our minds and uh, we'll start in something. When the invitation is extended, uh, we'll sing number 588. Please turn and mark number 588. And after you've marked 588, please roll over 824. And if you will, please stand and sing all three verses of number 824. 824. Some glad morning when this life is over. One of my favorite things to do is uh, remember old stories of when I was younger. I like to reminisce. My daughters have heard way too many stories. And most of them involve people from Lakeside, because that's where I grew up and that's where my friends were. Um, so this story is going to involve familiar faces that are here. Some are not here, but you still know them. But we all 
when we were here in our young 20s, or late teens, we all came to church, stayed as a youth group, but somehow we all ended up working at Sears uh, as well. Um, Chris worked at Sears, Christy worked at Sears, Brad and Jody Bays worked at Sears. I can't think of everybody who ended up working, so we would move from here to Sears, and we just ended up always hanging out. And, um, you know, the thing about friends is sometimes they're going to get you in the worst of trouble, and sometimes they're going to be the best savior you have. Someone that's going to pull you out of trouble. And this story, the same guy did the same thing. I mean, he did both things in this one night, and it always amazed me. But we went out one night, and as Clay County people do, um, we had finished work, and we were hanging out at someone's house, and we decided, hey, what better to do than let's go pile in someone's truck and find dirt roads, and, and let's go tear up dirt roads. So we pile in this guy's Charlie, I think, Charlie, it, his truck. And uh, I think I was sitting in the front, Brad and Jody Bays are somewhere in this little, and it's not a big truck. It's not like a four-door truck. It's got four seats, but the back seat's window's about that big. And you squeeze in, sit sideways, and your knees hit each other. And so they were in the back seat. Chris Milford's in the back. Mandy Harrington, I think, is in the back. Sean Sowards. A lot of people that went here, but there's a lot of people in this truck. And we're going down Blanding Boulevard, and we pass a police officer who is sitting in um, the Winn-Dixie parking lot. I, I don't know, but as we pass it going into Middleburg, and uh, we pass him, and uneventful passing. We weren't speeding. We weren't doing anything wrong. But boy, this guy comes and flips his lights on and comes and just tears off after us. And he jumps out of his car once we pull over, and he is mad. And he is yelling, How, who do you think you kids are? What do you think you're doing out here? And we're sitting in the truck thinking, what? We're just going, you know, kids. Well, who's the smart aleck who yelled something? Now, Chris Milford at this time was a long-haired hippie person. He was, he was a rough person, not the same clean-cut young man you see now, but he was a long hair, and he's sitting in the bed of the truck. Well, this cop pinpoints Chris, and he says, you, get out of the truck and get back by my car. Chris climbs out of the truck, and officer went, what did Chris do? What, I don't know, what did he do? We're all talking in the truck. No one knows what he did. Well, Brad Bays is very quiet. He's real quiet sitting in the back of the truck. I know you yelled at me out of your car. You think it's funny to make fun of police officers? Well, I mean, what in the world? None of us heard anything. Well, next thing you hear is Brad Bass. Um, guys, I, I yelled. I yelled at the cop. What do you mean you yelled? I couldn't even hear you. You're in the truck. He said, yeah, I, I yelled. Uh, and he called him, I guess uh, there's a nickname for police, and he called him a pig. And not, not rightfully so. And as a teen, he shouldn't have done it. It was wrong. And he did. You don't call people names. But this guy was really mad. And he had pinpointed Chris and had Chris back against the car. Well, Brad, we finally said, Brad, you got to go tell him. So Chris is taking the punishment for this. Well, Brad, I don't know. You know, I don't want to tell him. He's really mad. And so finally, Brad gets out of the car. And, uh, sir, I, I yelled it. Well, he berates Brad, yells at Brad, lets long-haired problem causer Chris get back in the bed of the truck. And we go on our way, and, and he just yells at us and, and lets us go. But the best part of the night is we go get stuck on the dirt road. Coming off the dirt road, we get stuck. Who comes to save us? That police officer. <laughs> and he came, and, and, he, and he just laughed. You know, he laughed, and you, you guys. But, it's, but the art of friends and having friends and the importance of good friends. You know, and, and one of the stories in the Bible that I always will go back to, if you have it, it's in Mark chapter 2. Um, it starts in verse 1. And, it, and when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching, and he was preaching the word to them. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him, and when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. At that moment, when they let him down, it wasn't the paralytic's faith, but it was when Jesus saw his friend's faith that he healed, and he said, Your sins are forgiven. You know, it's the importance of those friends because sometimes we're going to be that paralytic laying in the bed needing four friends. And sometimes we're going to be one of those four friends helping our brother and lifting him up. The importance of having those friendships, relationships that we can rely on 
It's something I'll tell the youth always. You know, the things that are going to keep you here are friends. I still, you know, with Chris and Justin and Brad, you know, we still, our youth group from when we were here, man, I'm just having my 30th high school reunion this year. They just sent me a message. 30 years can't be that old. But some of y'all taught me, so you're older. <laughs> but you have those relationships that can help you. The importance of remaining strong with your friends because you are going to need them. You're going to be weak at one moment and they're going to lower you down. They're going to be weak and you're going to be there for them. So it's the importance of our relationships. And I know a lot's been said about coming and the importance of being at church, but you cultivate those relationships face to face. We cultivate those relationships by being in each other's homes. We cultivate them by just the simple act of speaking to each other. So if you have the opportunity to make friends, this is, I can't think of a better place to do it, that you'll have better relationships. There may be people here that are struggling and need friends to pray for them. You know, when you come forward and ask for prayers, that's what we're here for. The more people praying for you and asking God to, to help you and strengthen you, the better. If you haven't had the chance and you have not been baptized, but you've considered it, there's no better time than to come forward right now as we stand and sing. Dear God, thank you for this day you blessed us with, Lord. Thank you for the opportunity we've had this evening to come and worship you in spirit and truth, Lord. Pray that you be with us as we go to our classes. Pray that we will take the lessons we learn and apply it to our everyday lives, Lord. Thank you for all the wonderful blessings you give us daily, Lord. Think most, most thankful for your son and his willingness to die so that we could have hope of eternal life one day with you, Lord. And be with us as we travel home this evening and be, help us to be back at the next point in time, Lord. It's in your son's name, Jesus. Amen.
just babble for a few moments to make sure everybody can hear me. Does that, does that sound good? We're good. People in the back, you can. Char people in the front, Charles says I'm good to go, so I guess I'll go. Um, I suppose most of you were in here for the invitation. Um, the young, young brother who made the presentation is my son-in-law. I think most everybody knows that already. I didn't know they had a brush with law before he, in, he asked my daughter to marry him, so <laughs> that was news to me. So anyway, it, it worked out okay, so that, that was fine. Um, as, as we started last week, we didn't finish this, and, and the, the goal is we'll finish it tonight, although if we don't, that won't be a serious problem. Uh, about the, this, this particular study, and I'm, I'm going to be uh, the, the teacher for this class through the month, each Wednesday night through the month of April. So, if it, because most of the time a lesson is, is, con, is confined to a single meeting time. But because I knew I had four days, uh, four different days to do this, I, I thought if I run over, that's okay, because there'll be a, a sense of continuity because you have the same teacher each time. So the, the first lesson is placing membership and, and coming forward. They, they, now just kind of review what we went through last time. The, because we're gonna, these are two separate topics. We're gonna go through placing membership first, then we're gonna finish up with coming forward. The, uh, the, the phrase placing membership, you won't find that in the Bible. But the assertion I'm making, and, and I think everybody was, was seeing this as we were studying this, is even though that phrase may not be there, and we may not see s such specific examples of people placing membership, by all means that practice was there. That practice was there. And it's continued on to this day. And in fact, as long as I've been in the Lord's Church, I didn't grow up in the Lord's Church, as, as long as I have been aware of it, this has always been done. So this has been a long-standing practice, and, and, and it most definitely is a good one, and it is, there's really this strong biblical basis for it. And so what we covered um, last time is we started out with, with well, why, why does this seem to make sense? Well, the first point was that ge geographically, geographically there were, there were congregations of the Lord's Church, or just local congregation churches that were identified with a particular geography. So that's one thing. Then within some of those uh, congregations, there were individual people that were identified associated with that. So now we have geography and we have people identified with that geography. So we kind of got, got going in that uh, direction. Um, Paul, in, in multiple places, the, the phraseology or the passage we used was in Romans where it talks about we are members of a body. In other words, there's this cohesive group of people together that are carrying out the Lord's work. And that's found in more than just one place, but where, where we studied was in Romans. Then we went through a bunch of uh, numerous responsibilities that the brothers and sisters had to each other. And so what that entailed was because they had responsibilities to each other, that must meant that they had proximity to each other, they knew each other, and they, and they there had this sense of community about them. Um, the, the final point that, that I want to bring in, because now is where we start diverging a little bit from the, from the first century, the first couple of centuries of Christianity, was how we live today. And I'm going to limit this to the United States, because we're fortunate in this, is, you know, early it's on, people just walked to their meeting place. There really wasn't other kinds of transportation. If you were very, very wealthy, you may have some other means, but by and large, everybody just walked there. Well, today, there are, is a plethora of church building locations. Some of them are trustworthy, some of them are true to God's word, some of them are not. And it's easy to drive in an automobile or some other a truck, a vehicle of some kind, it's very easy to go to another location. So you may not, you may not actually worship at the location that is closest to you. But most people choose to worship at the place that they find the most trueness to God's word and where they feel like they can contribute the most. But that may not necessarily mean where, where geographically is the closest. So that is a distinction. 
That is a distinction. And so that, in, at least in my view, that adds to the, the reason of, of placing membership is because this person may no, may no longer be your neighbor, but you do see them as brother and sister in Christ because they worship with you and you get involved in other activities, God's uh, their sponsored activities. Um, as I said, there was, there was a lot of responsibilities that, that Christians have towards each other. We study those in, in, in a fair amount of detail. And, and the underlying that means that, that people knew each other. They knew each other. I don't, Ken Dickerman's not here tonight, is he? I don't see him. Kim Dickerman came up after class. He had a very intriguing question. And he said, he says, well, he had looked at a secular study that said, well, what's the reach of the number of people that you can actually have close relationships with? And he had a number that this study had cited. I think it was like 150. And I don't doubt that, you know, that study, I'm sure the person that did that was, was uh, quite adept at that sort of, uh, I, that to me would be a sociology type of subject. And he said, well, it's kind of limited to 150. Well, this is, there's obviously, there's probably like 150 people in, well, not, maybe not quite, maybe 100 people in here. But during worship service, we have over 300. So can we have those close relationships with all of those people? That was the point Kim was making. Is that really possible? I don't know where he was going with his comments, but to me it's like, first of all, that, that, that span of reach that people have, brothers and sisters, that's, that's not a biblical concept. So there, there's no limit placed upon the number of people that we can consider to be brothers and sisters. Everybody we possibly can. And also, it just in, in my experience, and I think yours is probably going to be similar to that, in my experience is how many people do we really get close to? Well, there may be just a handful that we have a continuous close relationship with. However, what is probably going to happen with the passage of time, those relationships change. Some of them will fade. Now, these people are not forgotten, but some of those relationships will probably fade, and others will come up, you know, because of a need or because of a common um, a common interest, but they will, there will be a give and take. So the, the question was, is it, is it impossible in a large congregation to have the kind of relationships that the Bible says that we really need for each other? Well, first of all, that, that concept is not in the Bible, so my, my answer is no. And also, it is a question that has no answer. Because I, you know, people and relationships are dynamic, so they can change with time. There may be circumstances where we're drawn closer to somebody, and then that may fade with time. Yes, sir. Oh, here. I've traveled the country a fair amount, and any time I've gone, and I've gone to worship with a faithful body of Christians, there's been a comfort there. It's, I feel like I know them because we're like-minded. And even when I go back home to North Carolina, there's a couple congregations I visit, and I look forward to going to those congregations. Do I know those people closely? No, but I look forward to being with them because we're like-minded, and there's been a comfort of going anywhere o around the country and worshiping the faithful body of people that I feel at home. Yeah, good. In fact, just kind of add on to that, because I've experienced this, and I do want to show of hands of people that have experienced this. Um, I've been with a group of people, you know, say a fairly large group of people. I didn't know most hard, I didn't know hardly anybody. And, they, and, other, and the people didn't know each other. But after a time, I've had someone come up to me and ask me, and I think I've done the same thing, I would ask them, are you a member of the Lord's body? Are you a member of the Lord's church? Raise your hand if you've ever asked somebody that or if somebody has asked you that. Just kind of a, yeah. Isn't, isn't that unusual how that, that happens? But I think that's a wonderful thing. That for something, there's, there, there's something about our persona or their persona that it, that it stands out that, that we're different from the crowd. I think we should all find that encouraging that that, that does happen. Um, and as I said, it, it seems like most, a, a very large number of people in here have had that experience because I've had it, had it multiple times. All right. We're now going to get into 
the uh, concluding part of this. Now, what we did was we talked about the members. And now we're going to move into the, the, the final part of the placing membership component. And that is sort of, and to me, this is kind of the seal on the whole concept of having membership, being identified with a location, with being lo identified in the Lord's church in a specific location. And I'm, I'm asserting that that's because of an eldership, an eldership. What we're, the, the, the phrase, we're going to look at some of these verses. Maybe we'll look at all of them, but I'll, I'll probably go through them rather quickly. But the second sentence that I have up there in the, in the title part of, of this slide, it says, inferred are close relationships among the brethren along with teaching and training. Inferred the close relationship among the brethren. That's a close relationship of the elders with the brethren. That, that's inferred. And so... The, the first, let's, let's take a look at the first one. We, we may not spend a lot of time on these because these subjects could be, uh, they're very good subjects for the lesson at hand, though. There's, um, there's, there's some limitation. Let's go to 1 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 5. And I, let's see, I said in, in Titus, we may look at that, but I think I'm to, uh, to move things along, I'll probably just limit it to 1 Timothy but these are the qualifications of elders, or the quali qualifications of overseers or bishops. And it reads this way in the first five verses. This is a faithful saying, if a man desires a position of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of a wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house well, how will he take care of the church of God? Now, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of powerful statements in here, a lot of powerful phrases and descriptions about an elder, about their qualifications. So I'm, I'm going to ask you what they, in the, in the context of this class, in the context of this class, if you talk about someone who has these, these various characteristics, um, he's blameless, has one wife, there's, there's a whole list of, of, of qualifications here. Again, don't think real deeply on this. What, what, is, this, what is this very clearly stating about this elder or this you know prospective elder and the members because if you know these things about him what is it what is it that is 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 clear these are these are i would say these are fairly fairly um detailed qualifications fairly detailed so what is it, what does that say that people know about the elder do they know him well or do they not know him well Everybody, know well. they know him well, thank you. They know him well. See, they know him well. He, he's, he's no mystery to them. So he's, he's well known among this body of believers. And that's really the point that I wanted to make from that. The qualifications are there because clearly God says these are necessary qualifications. But for the, for the, in the context of this lesson, the, the, the key point is that the qualities about the elder are known. They're understood. This is the idea of community, proximity, closeness. Now, the, uh, in, verse, in Acts 20, verses 28 and 30, um, rather than read that, that one, that one is rather straightforward. What, someone just, what is the, you can paraphrase, what's the context that is, is here in Acts 20? I mean, there's, there's, there's probably a wealth of information there, but you can kind of limit it to one idea. What's the one idea? And, uh, and my bullet point kind of highlights it. What is it? What do the elders do? 
protect. Yeah, they protect. They protect against savage wolves. And what are those savage wolves? I mean, they, they, this is not literal. This is figurative. So what are, the, what are those savage wolves that is being referenced here? False teachers. They're false teachers. So again, these elders are knowledgeable. They know people. They know people. They know their, they know their brothers and sisters. And they also know those that are false teachers, savage wolves. Now, just as kind of an aside, the, those, those false teachers, those savage wolves that are, that are hint, uh, mentioned here, they're within the eldership. And that doesn't have to be that way, but within the context of those verses, that is very much what is being stated. So there's, there's this knowledge, this in-depth knowledge of each other. Again, the idea of community, the idea of people being around each other, knowing each other, being able to encourage and watch out for each other. Clearly, the elders are watching out for, for, the, uh, for the brothers and sisters. Um, limitations on charges. Well, I guess we should go ahead and look at that because it's uh, in 1 Timothy 5, verses 17 through 19. We can see what we have here. 1 Timothy 5, verses 17 through 19, and this reads, Let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture says, You shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. That's not what I wanted. Sorry. Um, somebody help me out. Where, where was I trying to find? About, this is about charges of a versus elders. That's not, that's not where we wanted to go here. Oh, excuse me. In verse 19, it says, Do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses. I, again, the point that I want to make, the, the idea of, of the two or three witnesses is people know each other. They know the elder. They're watching out for one another. And then the final point that we have here is teaching and training. The elders are, have, are training people. They're looking out for them. Why? Because they know them. They know what training should take place. So anybody have any questions on this? Because we're about ready to, to uh, move on to another, or to, to reach a concluding comment. Anybody have a thought here? Yes, sir. Connecting the two thoughts of placing membership and eldership. In my experience, starting out after I got married, I don't remember a congregation that did not have elders where they practiced the practice of placing membership. You just were there <laughs> and you were part of the group. And in my experience, early on we tried to find smaller congregations where we thought we could make a difference. But you learned after a while, if they didn't have elders, not much got done. And your efforts really were not as fruitful as what you had expected and wanted. So then the thought started saying, if we move and go someplace else, we will first of all look for congregations that have elders. And then down the road you refine that saying, having effective elders who follow what the Bible says and who do what you're just talking about. But I don't know, I don't know, maybe someone has been to a place where they didn't have elders and you went through the practice of placing mem uh, 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 membership but I don't think it happens. And, that, so, and the Bible clearly gives an example, tells Timothy to have elders in all congregations. And like you say, there are instructions for how the elders should operate. So the Bible wants us to have elders. Yes. But yeah, I, I, to be honest with you, I, have, I had not, I've not been in the Lord's Church that didn't, that didn't have elders. So I've, but I, but you're, you are correct. Or at least I, that, I have heard that as well, is, is they would, people would, look for a congregation that had elders. 
because they knew it was vital. And I think, and it could be that their experience was what you just stated, is, is that there didn't seem to be much activity without them because the leadership aspect is missing. The leadership aspect is missing. Yes, ma'am. I wanted to make a comment because um, I remember years ago we were at a congregation and how important God's word is on the limitation on charges uh, because at this congregation one of the elders was a terrible gossip. You know, there would be members that would have different things going on and he would counsel them but then come back and talk about it to the office staff. And then eventually that got out. And when it did, it caused a division in the entire congregation. I mean, it was, I don't know if it was split right in half, but what happened, you had some that were worshiping some other place in a barn, because there were some people that had like a lot of property and would pull the people there. So here there was the opportunity for the wolves to come in because they were having their own services. And then other people talking about this. It just caused so much uh, dissension and, and, and so many problems and people going the Facebook route and just, I don't even know to, to this very day if they are totally back together, but that was a huge red flag to get out of there because it was just something that opened up some kind of sore and it just spread. And it's so important for you know these things to be followed or for the men to abide by these things that God says. Okay, thank you. And in fact, uh, that the, the idea of, of the eldership is providing the, the leadership and the cohesion for the local group is vitally important. Because as, as Regina was pointing out, without that and with, with, with dissension, it sounds like maybe an elder did not have the qualifications, they didn't have the qualifications that were necessary. Um, it, it caused that congregation to split. Something we're gonna talk about in the next subject, not, not coming forward, but the lesson after this one is actually is, is somewhat tie, uh, related to that subject. It's discipline. That's going to be the next subject. But maybe not today. So we, yes, Wilbur. When I think about placing membership, when I think about placing membership, I think about I'm a member of Christ Church, but it's worldwide. So anywhere. But I say for I place my membership. I place my membership at Lakeside, so that way the elders know they can depend on my contribution when they make out what the bills and are. They know about what money they got to work with. If I'm not here, they know I'm part of this congregation, and they go want to inquire if I'm sick or what is the matter with why I ain't here. And I got the ones here I know who can, they like brothers, close <laughs> brothers, you know, you can go to them now. That's what I think about membership. I think about um, placing, I'm going to a certain church. I'm a, I'm a member of all the churches, but I'm going to a certain place and uh, they can depend on me or watch out for me better than if I'm bouncing from here to there to there. Uh, yeah. yeah, well said, well said. I become part of this local congregation. I can help and people can help me. And we can do that is because we've identified this is we were, where we want to be. These are the people that we want to be with. So thank, thank, that, was, that was very well stated. So to close this out, well, wait a minute. Maybe I have another slide here. Um, to, to close this out, placing membership. The phrase is not there. The practice in the New Testament very much is. And hopefully, after what we've gone over over the past one and a half evenings of class time, is we say, well, how vital it is. 
it's absolutely vital to identify that this is where I want to be. This is where I'm going to participate. This is where I'm going to contribute. This is where I'm going to work. This is where I want to be identified. This is where I am going to help other people. This is the place that I know that people will help me. If, we, if, if faithful Christians, if they just go from one congregation to another and never put roots down any place, can they worship God? They can. They're missing a lot of their Christianity because that, that relationship, that connection with the brothers and sisters is not going to be strong. That ambiguous state of, of being a Christian but not having a church home is eliminated when someone identifies, this is where I want to be. These are, these are my people and these people want me. This is, this is how the Lord wants us. This is how the Lord wants us. Okay. Moving on to the end of this subject, the end of this lesson, rather. The, the phrase that, that I, I grew up in a denomination. I grew up in a denomination. Um, they, they didn't have an invitation. Not that I can remember. Of course, you know, I was, I was mostly like at elementary school, maybe high school. I didn't pay much attention, I have to be honest with you. I was not a good person to have in the auditorium. But I don't remember this denomination ever doing this. But, but every, again, in my experience in the, in the Lord's Church, everybody does this. Everybody that's faithful does this. And usually the phrase is that, you know, if, if, you, need, if you need some help, come forward. Usually it's just referred to as the invitation. That is a practice. Is that, again, is that phraseology in the New Testament. That phraseology is not there, but the, but the practice is, the practice is of responding to God's word, to hear a gospel message and then respond to it. That is very much biblical. The, the difference, I think, is culturally things have changed. Because we're going to look at these passages and, and see how, how people responded under these circumstances. The first one is going to be, you know, all of us know this extremely well. Acts 2, 37 and 38. This is at the conclusion of the first gospel sermon. When Peter was, I guess you would say, was the lead speaker and then out the other apostles were, were sort of chorusing what he was saying. And so he was going through, he was related the, the, the history of the Jewish nation, he went through the recent events over the last several weeks, and he was talking about Christ and how Christ was murdered. And so now we read in get on the right page here, two thirty-eight. Well, let's start with thirty-seven. Well, let's start with thirty-six. Therefore. Let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. So this, the, the audience, the listeners, they were very familiar with what he was saying because most likely if they had not actually witnessed what had gone on the last few weeks, they had heard it many times over. So this was not news to them. They had heard this. Verse 37, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Okay, they were moved by the gospel. This audience, basically of Jewish, faithful Jewish people, they heard this gospel message, they were moved by it, and they responded. They responded, what shall we do? Now, we're going we're gonna to go forward one verse, and then we're going to come back to that thought. Then Peter said to them, Repent, let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The, the distinction I want to point, point out is maybe it's the circumstances of, of the message, maybe it's culturally. In, in this case, who actually initiated 
Who initiated the question for action to be taken? Who did it? The people did. The listeners did. The listeners initiated the question. And Peter gave them the answer. The listeners initiated the question. Peter gave them the answer. So when, when we have the invitation, how does it work? How does it work? Does, some, does, does the audience usually say something? Or is, it, or is the audience listening and silent? Was it Charles? Yeah, Char what Charles said is, is the, the, in, in our culture, the audience is listening. The audience doesn't say something. The audience is listening. The, the, the preacher or the speaker makes, asks the question. Ask the question. Is there any difference there? Well, no, there's no differences because, because the, the message was the same and, and the intended result will be the same, but it's a different way of how it's initiated. It's initiated by the, by the audience. Like I said, do I have a good answer why that is? I think that may be culturally as, as much as anything. And, so, and probably the passages that we're gonna read, this may be, um, something that has to do somewhat with the, with the circumstances of what had occurred. But the way that it starts is a little bit different, but it's still, it's, it's, the, it's the question, it's the imitation and the response. It just, it's just usually done in a little bit different order. Let's take a look at the next one. Let's take a look at Acts 17. This is the sermon by Paul on Mars Hill. He's speaking to probably a cosmopolitan group of people. Uh, many of them are going to be Greeks because he's in, he's in Athens at the time. So let's take a look at, at Acts 17, verses 30 through 34. Now, he's, he's gone through and made the gospel message, and verse 30 reads, Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked. Now, bear in mind, he's talking about times of ignorance because he was talking about the Mosaic law was not given to the Gentiles. The Mosaic law was given to the Jews. And so he's calling that period of time when the Gentiles didn't directly have God's word. He's calling that times of ignorance. But now what he says, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. All men everywhere to repent. Very straightforward assertion that he's making. Because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained and has given assurance to, uh, of this all by raising him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked while others said, we will hear you again on this matter. So Paul departed from among them. However, some men joined him and believed, among them Dionysius the Areopagite and a woman called Damaris and others with him. Yet Paul gave this gospel message. He talked about repentance. He talked about who Jesus Christ was. He talks about repentance. And he, he left them. And, and how, how was the response? Who, initi who, who gave the response back? in a verbal fashion, the audience. So again, the audience, the audience responded. Now, when, when people are silent, that doesn't mean they don't respond. They may be just doing it internally. In fact, I would, I would, I would say that, that most of us are moved by a sermon and we actually respond to that message. Sometimes very, very strongly we respond, and sometimes when, when, we, we, uh, when we come forward, we're responding in a very obvious, very physical way because we, we feel like we need the help and we need something to happen. But when we hear a, a gospel message, we are responding most likely internally. So we don't voice something. We usually don't say something. Again, what's the point I'm getting at? Is it, is it an invitation? 
is there a, is there a request and is there a response? The answer is yes. I'm just saying that in the first century, the order was a bit different. So is everybody with me so far? I'm not, I'm not trying to turn things around. I'm just saying that people respond a little differently back then than they do today. Yes, sir, we got it. I was just gonna say, I think the, the order may have been a little different because the majority of the people that he was talking to were completely unsaved and not a room full of faithful Christians or mostly faithful Christians. So it's, maybe the audience was a little different? No, I, I think that could well just be the case is, is that uh, this, in, in, in these cases, it could be that this was the first time these folks had heard the message. And so it was, it was such a striking message, they couldn't do anything. They couldn't keep quiet. They couldn't, and they shouldn't. They were so moved that they, that they responded. Go ahead. I, I just want to point out, talking about audience responses in Acts chapter 7 and the audience's response to Stephen, um, which was, it says that they were cut to the heart. They had a completely different response. And <laughs> yeah, not a good one. Ended up having the, the first Christian martyr in Stephen. So the, the audience response is significant uh, in the, the heart and the hardened hearts of, yeah. of the audience is something to point out also. Yeah, that, that's a good point. And in, in this case, the response was, was totally negative. In fact, it was a murderous response. And, you know, I, I, I'm in a room full of brothers and sisters here and Hopefully, no, but none of us. Again, I, I think I think we respond to the gospel message. I, I think we just do it internally and we silently. And sometimes we maybe we don't respond internally very well. I mean, sometimes we feel a, a, an affront by that. Sometimes you know it's it's pricked, but that's probably a good thing. If we're not if we're not challenged in our faith by the God's word, maybe we're not thinking deeply enough. But that that is that is a good point. Sometimes the, mess, sometimes the response is not good. It's very negative. It's not looking for help. All right, the last one here that I wanted to cover is in James chapter 5, verses 16. It says, Confess your trespasses to one another and to pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. This is, I would say, more in line with the way that we experience someone coming forward or the way that, that we today respond to the invitation. Because what James is, you know, he usually is in a, writes an economy of word And he's, he, is, he is clear. He says, confess your trespasses to one another. So confessing them to one another, I mean, that could be in a, in a private sense. It could be. It could be a public, in a public sense. But either way, there is, he, he, is, he is moving people to confess sins. So why, why, why confess sins to one another? What's the point? Why do it? Yeah, Linda. So you can pray for each other and help them out. Right, say that second part again. And help them. And help them, yes. Pray for each other and help them. The idea of, 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 uh, of confessing trespasses to each other, I think, is, is it's, it, I'm probably just stating the obvious, but I, but I think it needs to be said, is why do we confess our trespasses, our sins to one another? Is because we do want people to pray for us. And we are admitting that we need help. And if you're among brothers and sisters in a congregation that know each other, and we admit that we need help, what invariably happens? We get help. We get help. Maybe we're overwhelmed with help, but we get help. That's a good thing if we're overwhelmed with help. We get the help. 
we get it. Yes, Pat. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Let's. <laughs> okay. <laughs> No, what she said was, is it, is it an act, does that express humility, I'm going to put it in my words, does that express humility to say that we have sins? And, and I, I, would, I think everybody in this room would say, yes, absolutely. That shows a sense of humility because I can't do it on my own, I need help. It's good. So yes. Now in the last few minutes that we have left, um, I just want to briefly list the responses. And again, when, when I started this class last week, I was talking about the fun, this, is, this came from a Christian fundamentals course is, is where this came from. And, and so when the next thing we're going to go through may seem very, very obvious, but I, but I think it's worth saying. I think it's worth saying. When people respond to the invitation, when they come forward, what reasons are you, what reasons do they do that? Why? What do they come, why? Well, sometimes you have to confess some of your, your sins to others. Right, that's, that, just, which, what, what we just read in James, is one is the confession of sins, because we, we feel guilt, which is good, that we feel guilt because we did something wrong. What's, uh, Pat's touched upon the other side, what's the other side of that? We, we feel guilt, why, and then, and get help, pardon me? Yeah. You've brought some kind of a, a, a bad reputation in the church. Well, they see what you did, and so knowing what you did, I'll never go there. So you need to, um, those kind of things that, that people are seeing outwardly. You don't see a lot of what goes on in the inside, yeah. but if someone is outwardly seeing, I think it's even more important to confess that publicly. Yeah. Right, kind of a cleansing of our soul, so to speak, because we know we did something wrong and we did it in a public way. Um, th this is a little bit off track, but that, yeah, that's a very good point. When, when we have sinned publicly and we bring it to the congregation's attention, it's, it's, it's for our benefit primarily. Does, do, do the listeners, does the, do the people hear, hearing that, how are they benefited? Because there's going to be some benefit from hearing it. What is it? Yeah, Frank. It gives them an opportunity to share someone else's burden. Share somebody else's burden. Also, is, is think of it as is someone, someone did something evil. They did something evil publicly, and they express it. The listeners can learn from that, and they might say, well, hmm. I did that also, but it didn't strike me as being wrong. See, maybe they, they don't have the sensitivity that they should, but they hear somebody else is, is, has contrition over that, and so they, they it, it occurs to them, like, I'm wrong too. I need to take care of that. I need to do something about it. And sometimes, it, it, sometimes when we hear people talk about things, evil things that they've done, sinful things that they've done, when we hear that, it, it brings an awareness to us that maybe that's not something that I have thought of before. That's, that's something new. That's something I need to learn to. Okay, that's the second bill. I'm going to finish this up real quick. Um, so what, what's, what, is, what is the, when, when the invitation is, is given, what is really kind of the key thing that most speakers are looking for? What kind of response is it? What do they want? Okay, it usually starts out, there may be some of you in this audience who have not obeyed the gospel. So, the, 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 like, like, why do people come forward? One, is they're not Christians. This is, an op this is an opportunity to become a Christian. That's one. The other is to confess sins because, you know, they may be public. They would help one another. Um, what, well, like, I'll just move on. What, what's another reason people come forward? They feel weakened. They feel weakened because of the circumstances in which they find themselves. So they, need, they, they want people to pray for them because I need help. 
I need help. I want people to pray for me. I want people to know that, they, that what I'm going through so I can be strengthened because I know people are praying for me. And, and uh, chances are somebody's going to be able to relate exactly to what you're going through. Chances, I would say, are extremely high that that will be helpful. Ryan. Why don't you wait just one second? Frank is r rushing over here. To, thank you. We can't, in this life, we're not going to get through this by ourselves. So going forward, like saying, I can't do this certain by myself. I need your prayers. Because it may look like on the outside that we have it going, we got it handled. No one's perfectly got it handled. So, you know, going forward, I'm saying, I can't do this by myself. I need, I need some prayers and support. Yes, yeah. Chances are we can't do it on our own. Final point. Final, well, actually, the final reason that I thought of for why, why people will respond to the invitation. One is they've, there's some problems in their family life. There's, they, they've got an aunt, an uncle, a friend, a neighbor, somebody who's struggling, and they're asking for prayers for that person's behalf. So it's not, it's not directly for them, it's for someone that they love. So why do people come forward? One, to become a Christian. One, sometimes to confess their sins. Uh, sometimes people just are downtrodden. They need to be lifted up. And the other is they're seeking help, prayers, or it could be another kind of form of help, for people that they know. Not necessarily for themselves, they're asking for somebody else's benefit. So with that, I've run way over. My apologies for that. Thank you for your participation. We did finish this, this lesson. It took two, it took longer than I thought, but I, we, I, at least as I learned a lot, hopefully you did too. We had a lot, of, a lot of good discussion, good points made. So we're now finished with this about placing membership and coming forward. Next week, what we'll start is about discipline, discipline. Everybody have a great week. Thank you for being here.